Okay, we'll go ahead and get started back up so we don't push ourselves uh, too late. Uh, we are grateful for the historical perspective that uh, has been presented to us from Dr. Dockery. Uh, it's always interesting, informative, and educational, however, uh, when you uh, see these matters of doctrine played out in a more uh, dynamic fashion. Uh, and that's exactly what our goal is uh, in this next segment, is to be able to allow two men of differing positions, but in that broad river of Baptist life, yet somewhat different feeder streams, uh, explain uh, where they are, where their convictions lie, in such a way uh, that would continue to increase our understanding of uh, these issues as well as how we can work together and remain in that same river of Baptist life. Uh, grateful for Kevin Smith moderating this. He will then, uh, after uh, moving through some doctrinal points, be presenting questions that we've collected uh, over the course of the last few days from those who were attending the conference. So, uh, Brother Kevin, I'm going to turn things right over to you. Thank you, Brother Paul, and uh, it's good to be here and to be able to share with these wonderful brothers. Um, what we want to do is just take a little bit over an hour and discuss some questions and uh, have two brothers that represent uh, different streams in Southern Baptist life to address these issues. Uh, first, we want to kind of go through what traditionally have been called, uh, I guess, the points of Calvinism or TULIP or some things that you're familiar, that some labels you may have had, heard before and let them discuss them and they respond to them. But uh, before we do that, uh, Dr. Dockery gave such a wonderful historical presentation and uh, I teach church history as well as preaching, so I'm always uh, interested in what people think historically. And so just to kind of break the ice a little bit, I'd love to ask Dr. Lemke and Dr. York. Um, in 2008, uh, in Greensboro, Dr. Page was elected president of the SBC, and it was a, a historic meeting. Uh, and the day before his election, there was a panel during the pastor's conference, and Brian Wright was the president of the pastor's conference. And Dr. Moeller and Dr. Patterson, uh, Dr. Moeller of Southern Seminary, Dr. Patterson of Southwestern, discussed issues of predestination and evangelism and cooperation and those kind of things. And I, I felt good coming out of 2008 in Greensboro. And so uh, you two men live in Southern Baptist life, and I'm just kind of wondering, uh, the fact that we're here today, the fact that we have the things going on in SBC life that we do, uh, in, your, in your minds, what did happen in 2008 with that discussion or what did not happen in that discussion and why, why did that discussion not get us to, uh, wh why are we here today if we had that discussion between Dr. Moeller and Dr. Patterson in 2008? Well, mostly because those two don't know anything. <laughs> uh, but Dr. Lemke and I are going to straighten this out today. We will. We will uh, I'm, I caught your disease with this mic there, Kevin. Um, let, let, let me say that no one discussion is going to get us all so focused that we don't see this coming up anymore. The reality is we need to keep having lots of discussions. We need to keep looking at the Word. What does the Word say? Exhorting one another, encouraging one another. We need to not be threatened by somebody having a different position than we do. The gospel of Jesus Christ has to be the focus. And we're going to have some different understandings about the way that that gospel is applied. And as we've heard from Dr. Dockery this morning, that's part of our heritage. That's not going to change. We're never going to be monolithic. There are different streams within those that are more, you know, we don't really have any true Arminians in Southern Baptist life. I would not in any way call Dr. Lemke an Arminian. But, uh, you know, we've got different streams. Uh, some that have come out with a statement recently called the traditional uh, Baptist understanding of salvation, but I believe Dr. Lemke is not a signatory of that. He, he did not sign that statement. And so they've got differences on that side. 
uh, I'm called a Calvinist, though I, I'll tell you my deep, dark secret. Uh, I've never read Calvin. Uh, I've never read the Institutes. I've read some of Calvin's exegetical stuff. But I've never read the Institutes, so he said that today. Uh, that there are, and, and frankly, I don't call myself a Calvinist. I call myself a Baptist. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a Baptist by conviction. I do believe uh, I have a high view of, of God's predestination of his people to eternal life. I, I see that in the scripture. But I don't believe anything because John Calvin said it because it came out of the Reformation. I believe what I believe because I believe that I see it in scripture. I understand there are some wonderful godly brothers and sisters of mine who read the same scripture that I read and they don't see what I see. I'm okay with that. We ought to be able to love each other through that. We ought to be able to focus on the Great Commission together. And, and there's a lost world out there that they really don't care how many points we have. They need to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's what I'm all about. And I hope and truly believe that if anybody looks at my track record of uh, 30 years in the ministry, and so much time on the mission field and witnessing and, and going to, to people with the gospel, uh, that it speaks for itself. I, I think it's important that we not caricature one another. Mm -hmm. And I understand from guys that aren't as Calvinistic as I am, they sometimes they say, well, you Calvinists make us feel stupid. You, you act like we're stupid because we don't believe something. Let me say, I apologize for that. I, I apologize for any kind of arrogance that I've ever come across with or that any of those that see uh, soteriology the way that I see that they've come across with, I, I, I'm truly sorry for that. that. That has no place among brothers uh, in the way we treat one another. I, I have sometimes felt like I've been called a heretic. And, you know, I, I, again, I, I hope my life says something different than that. There's some members of my church here today, and I will tell you, the first time they knew I was a Calvinist was when it appeared in the Western Recorder that I was going to be at, uh, on this program. Because <laughs> I don't talk about Calvinism. I don't talk about Calvinism. The, the word Calvinism is not important to me. I will tell you what I do. They've heard me preach through John 17. And Jesus said, I pray not for the world. I pray for these you have given me. And I preach that there is a group of people that is the love gift of the Father to the Son, that God knows exactly who they are. Uh, I don't see how, I, I mean, I, I personally can't get anything else out of John 17 when Jesus prays that than that. I understand not everybody sees it that way, okay? But uh, I, I preach that. I don't need to call it Calvinism. And I don't need for you to understand exactly the way I do, but here's what I do need from you. I need from you as my brother and sister to give me the right to believe that, to teach that, to preach that, because it's what I believe in the scripture. And Dr. Docker talked about this has always been one of the great Baptist values is that we believe in, in soul liberty and the priesthood of, of the believers that we all are competent before the Lord. And we, we have to stand before him and answer for that. So we need to have grace for one another. And I, I, what I want to come out of this conversation today is that I want those that disagree with me to see that what I believe is still a credible uh, understanding of Scripture, even if you disagree with it. It's, it's not heretical. It's not dangerous. Uh, it's one of those things that's held in tension. And the other thing I want to come out of this is that we see that even though we might have disagreement, that the Great Commission embraces us all, and we must all embrace the Great Commission and take the gospel to all the world. And that's what I hope comes out of this. Amen. Dr. Lemke, since 2008, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think uh, maybe a lot of people thought that uh, the patterson moeller discussion was going to be a debate, and uh, they really did not go in that direction. They really we're focused more on how can we work together uh, more constructively. And, and, and so they, 
there were some of the differences that, that came out in the discussion, but uh, the focus was on how can we work together, and certainly that's the focus of our, our meeting today. Um, I think another thing is sometimes language from either side is used in a, with a code definition that we may be using some of the same words, but we're putting different meanings on those words. Uh, you know, when we say, God so loved the world, what does that mean? Uh, do we put a special definition on the word world? Or when it says it's, it's his desire that all should be saved, uh, do we put a special definition on all? So, uh, you know, each of us have strong commitments to the inerrancy of Scripture. And what really differentiates the two viewpoints is which text you take as primary and then maybe reinterpret the others in light of those texts and which you, you know, you, you maybe take somebody else's primary text and you have a different reading of it, a different understanding of it that fits within your theology and, and with the other primary text. You can't reconcile it with your primary text. And, and so I think we're all trying to get at what the Bible means. Um, we have maybe different visions and different interpretations of different visions of what it says about God and salvation and different interpretations of the different texts. I mean, we have the same thing in millennial views. I mean, whether you're going to take the eschatological discourse as primary, the book of Revelation as primary, the book of Daniel as primary, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians as primary. I mean, what text are you going to take as primary is going to say a lot about which millennial position you come out with. We're all trying to find the correct interpretation, but we have different visions of it. Now, it really doesn't matter in, in eschatology, but salvation and the doctrine of God really do matter. And so I think that's what makes this one an issue that really has uh, an onus that another issue that we can sort of laugh about that, you know, we differ in eschatology really doesn't matter as much. But this is so much the core of what is the gospel and, and what is it that we share with people and you know, can you say God loves you to a lost person? And, uh, you know, can you uh, uh, feel like the, that uh, you, you can offer the gospel to everyone? So um, those are some very important issues, and it really shapes how you do ministry in a way that eschatology does not. So, uh, but I do hope that we can uh, find ways to work together more constructively. Um, in, in talking about where we are now, I, I wrote some articles some time back about the fault lines in Southern Baptist life. And, and this is not the only fault line. <laughs> there is the big church, small church fault line. There's the pro-GCR, anti-GCR fault line. There is the pro-state convention and association and anti-state convention and association fault line. And you could get, there are several more. Uh, you know, name change, not name change fault line, as uh, Dr. Doctor was talking about. I mean, there's all kinds of fault lines, and they tend to overlap to some extent. So if you get a fault line with GCR, that also goes over and impacts a Calvinist, non-Calvinist discussion. And, and that is a, a really significant factor, I think, to this sort of continual unhappiness that Dr. Docker was talking about. It's not just one issue, it is a cluster of interrelated issues that really, at the face of it, have nothing to do with each other. But there is a sense of distrust. So, for example, some people, you know, thought GCR was a Calvinist conspiracy, you know, and... Uh, you know, uh, some people thought the uh, traditional Baptist statement was an effort to change the Baptist faith and message. I mean, there's, there's distrust that leads to probably exaggerating what the other side is saying and not really, and, and really going beyond 
uh, where they really are. So hopefully we can listen to each other, talk to each other, understand what our words mean and what we're really saying, and uh, more than that, put Jesus first and, and his great commission and uh, do the work of an evangelist. Amen. I'm going to uh, use my iPhone timer here <laughs> and see if we can do this in a, uh, about an hour. And this is what I would love, love to do in that line of understanding differences and being honest about our differences. Now, one thing I really want to challenge you to, to embrace, that if we say we can come together despite differences, then we ought to at least be honest and clear about the differences. And so we uh, need to kind of articulate those. And so uh, why don't we do this? Let's yeah. walk through what we, what was classically called uh, five points of Calvinism or however you label that. And Dr. York, why don't you take uh, three or four minutes and say what you believe about point one. And Dr. Lemke, take uh, three or four minutes and respond to that and uh, what you affirm of that or what you do not affirm of that. And uh, let's go back and forth like that. If we do that at least five times, that'll take us about 30, 35 minutes okay. to do and that. Some of them won't require that much time. That'll leave us, uh, you know, uh, probably more people want to talk about the L than the T. So uh, the, the first point uh, known as the first point of Calvinism is total depravity. And what that means is Dr. Dockery already said, he, he's done a lot of our work for us, frankly. It doesn't mean that people are as evil as they can possibly be. What it means is that every part of their being is fallen. God said to Adam and Eve, on the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree, you shall what? Not get sick. You shall die. And that man, since that act, has been dead in trespasses and sins, and this makes him, and, and here even, you know, uh, people disagree. It, does this render us unwilling or unwilling and incapable of exercising faith? In effect, well, the effect is the same. It's like uh, if a buzzard is starving to death, that buzzard is flying over a wheat field, and it's full of wheat, but that buzzard will not stop and eat that wheat, no matter how hungry he is, because... That's not his nature. He's bound by his nature. What's he looking for? He's looking for rotten, dead carrion, dead meat. And it's, he's free to eat that wheat, but he will not do it because it's against his nature. And because of sin, our nature has been rendered against God, left to ourselves. We do not want God to rule over us. We do not want God's grace left to ourselves because we are totally sinful in every part of our being, and that's why we require an act of the Holy Spirit to make us willing, because left to ourselves, we are not. Dr. Lemke. Well, let me say what we agree and what we don't agree. We agree, most Baptists will say they, they agree with depravity. I don't think most Baptists agree with total inability in the way that some Calvinists uh, define it. But we would agree with universal depravity. That is, as Isaiah 53, 6 says, we all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We would affirm what Romans 3, uh, 10 says, there's none righteous, no, not one. We would affirm what Romans 3, 23 says, that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we would affirm Romans 5, 12 and 18, that all have sinned in the likeness of Adam. We would also agree with uh, what uh, Timothy George has called radical depravity. That is, we're not just sinful, but we're rotten <laughs> to the core. Uh, Isaiah 64, 6, we are all an unclean thing. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. And, the, and Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So we agree on depravity. Now, the, again, as Dr. York said, I guess it's a question of degree. We would also agree on the, what he said, that without the help of the Holy Spirit, we will not come to salvation. 
And uh, that's why Baptists are neither Pelagian nor semi-Pelagian. Uh, to be Pelagian believes that you can find your way basically to God on your own. Uh, to be semi-Pelagian means you can start your way toward God and then maybe God assist you along the way. Uh, both of us agree, and actually Arminians agree with this also, uh, that uh, uh, our sinfulness is such that we will not initiate uh, a path toward God. Our going toward God is only as we are drawn by the Holy Spirit. Whether you call it enabling grace, the Arminians uh, call it prevenient grace, but there is a grace that leads you toward salvation. Now, the question is, is there anything left that, is, uh, that can affirm God under the leadership and conviction and convincing of the Holy Spirit? Um, and I think most Baptists believe that there is. And, uh, you know, what does the Baptist faith and message say? It says, through the temptation of Satan... Man transgressed the command of God and fell from his original innocence, whereby his posterity inherit not sin, not guilt, but a nature and an environment inclined toward sin. Therefore, as soon as they are capable of moral action, they're not born in sin, born guilty of sin, but as soon as they are capable of moral action, they become transgressors and are under condemnation. That's Baptist Faith and Message, Article 3. So uh, I don't think that the Baptist Faith and Message affirms original sin in the Catholic sense, that it's, um, it's something that comes in your DNA as uh, some kind of transmitted disease. Uh, uh, but it is something that's primary. You and we inherit certainly an orientation, a nature that is inevitably going to sin. But we are not yet guilty of sin until we actually actually act on it when we come to the appropriate age. Amen. Second point. Well, there's so much that he said with which I disagree. <laughs> Uh, and my sinful nature really wants to to, uh, <laughs> to respond, but um, the the second point is unconditional election, which basically says that uh, I mean clearly election is taught in the scripture. That that's undeniable. The word is used. Uh, there, there's a sense in, in, in some sense, God clearly chose uh, either individuals or a group to Himself. And in that, doing that, unconditional election says that this choice of some persons to himself is not based on anything in them. God did not look and say, well, this person is worth more to the kingdom than this person, and therefore I'm choosing them, or I'm choosing them, but it is contingent on them doing this or, or accepting this. That God's choice is totally unconditional. Uh, it does not depend on any foreseen merit in them. It is clearly and only an act of grace, a unilateral act of grace on God's part. That's what unconditional election means. <clears throat> well, we would agree on a lot of this. Um, we certainly would agree that salvation is by grace through faith. It is not by works, lest anyone should boast. Probably the second most popular verses beyond John 3.16 for most Baptists is Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, uh, that focuses on, on salvation by grace. So uh, we all have doctrines of grace. Calvinists aren't the only ones who believe in grace. Um, and we agree that the initial impulse, the the conviction, the initiative, everything else that leads to salvation is initiated by God. It is not initiated by us, and there's certainly no good work that we could possibly do that would deserve or earn our salvation. Now, um, is there any condition 
on that? Um, well, I think that there is. And um, uh, it, it is not a condition that uh, God is in any way um, held uh, hostage to. Obviously, with his perfect foreknowledge, he knows everything's going to happen from before the beginning. So there are no surprises for God. Uh, but he does, I mean, can God be so sovereign that he gives us a choice? Um, and, and that's what it seems like in Scripture. I'll mention some of those in a minute. But again, Baptist Faith and Message, article on salvation. Salvation involves the redemption of the whole man and is offered freely to who? All who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's conditional on them accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. Regeneration is defined in the Baptist Faith and Message as a heart, a change of heart wrought by the Holy Spirit through the conviction of sin to which the, the sinner responds in repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, there's something that you must do. Justification in the Baptist faith and message is defined as God's gracious and full acquittal upon principles of his righteousness of all sinners. Who? All sinners? No, those who repent and believe in Christ. So these are all conditional on some kind of, of human response. In fact, if you go back to the 19... 25 Baptist Faith and Message, it says that um, in the article on regeneration, that regeneration is a work of God's free grace conditioned upon faith in Christ. It literally uses that word conditional. So um, uh, I think there is an understanding that, that most Baptists would have that, that God has provided that grace, but he's not going to force it on us. It's going to come uh, because of uh, it, certainly his free grace, but it is something we must receive. Uh, John 1, 12, as many as received him, to them he gave the gift to become the children of God. Uh, I, I want to respond to one thing. I think you've you've engaged in some non sequiturs there because the article is unconditional election. It's not unconditional regeneration. And the thing that you said, you read those statements, is that regeneration is conditioned on those things. I agree with that. God's election, though, is not conditioned on those things. It would, that would make God contingent on man's act. And his election is unilateral. Now, I agree that there is no person, and I do mean no person, who is regenerated by the Holy Spirit apart from repentance and faith. So that, that is not the same thing. But God's election is, is not conditioned on those things. God's election guarantees those things. Now, I know you disagree on that, but I'm just saying that when you use the word, when you quote the Baptist faith, the message, and you use the word conditional, it wasn't in the context of election. It was in the context of regeneration or the act of, of uh, being saved, and that's a, yeah. I say it's a different thing. With, with regard to, and I should have said, certainly, and I, it really troubles me when I hear some Baptists say, we don't believe in predestination. Well, then you don't believe in the Bible. <laughs> if you don't believe in election, you don't believe in the Bible. So, I mean, no one, no Baptist should say, I don't believe in election, or I don't believe in predestination. What I think they usually mean is they don't mean, they don't believe in double predestination. But the pattern I see is in Romans 8. Those whom he foreknew, them he predestined. And those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those that he justified to be glorified. So, so I, you know, I understand it, as many Baptists do, on the basis of God's foreknowledge. Um, obviously, Calvinists disagree. Let me, go ahead. Let, let me just introduce the third point. And just let you know that you could hear this articulated as limited atonement, or you could hear this articulated as particular redemption. And I think even Dr. George has another nomenclature. Uh, so, but please explain what uh, the third point. Well, the third point, often called limited atonement, uh, is uh, semantically unfortunate because it makes it sound somehow like uh, what Christ did 
uh, is, is somehow limited in its ability. Uh, that, uh, I don't believe that. There, there are many different shades of Calvinist view about this issue called limited atonement or particular redemption. I can't speak for all Calvinists. I, I can only tell you what, what I believe and, and why I believe it scripturally. Um, in the Old Testament, when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, I ask you this question, for whom did he make an atonement? Did he make an atonement for the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Hittites and the Jebusites? Or did he make an atonement for a particular people? To whom did God say, out of all the nations of the world, I have chosen you? Did he say that to all people everywhere, or did he say that to a particular group of people? And if Jesus is our high priest, if Jesus entered into that holy place to make an atonement for his people, then the question is, who are those people? Now, I believe that those people are all those who will ever put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ in repentance. I, I believe that. I, I, I reject any view that makes regeneration a work uh, of the Spirit that happens apart from the means of the preaching of the gospel, apart from repentance and faith. Uh, that is, what in my, I would define that as a truly hyper-Calvinist view. But, Dr. Lemke introduced Romans chapter 8. And to me, what's often called the golden chain of salvation is a beautiful description uh, of it because uh, he, he, listen to that. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God who are the called according to his purpose. Now, is that a promise for everybody? Does, do all things work together for good for everybody? No. It's for those who are whom? The called according to his purpose. Now, who are those people? Listen to this. I'm reading out of the, uh, the ESV here. Uh, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Okay? Now, there's debate about what this word foreknew means. Does that mean mere prescience? In other words, that God knew in advance who these people were, that he knew that they would repent, and therefore he predestined them because he knew that they would repent and believe. Well, frankly, that to me is, in my, that's nonsensical. That makes, again, God contingent on something that he foresaw that they would do. But since God is the original cause of the universe, since, since he created man, then this foreknowledge, to me, goes much more along with the way the word know is used in the Old Testament. Adam knew his wife. I mean, uh, that's a knowledge of, uh, that's intimate, that is personal. And, and here it says that God foreknew. He knew beforehand, and those whom he knew beforehand, knew intimately, he predestined. And that word prohorizo, he set out their horizon uh, in advance. And uh, those that he, uh, he, he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. Now, if you work backwards from that, let's just begin at the end thing. Who gets glorified in the end? Who will be glorified? Some of those who got justified or all of those who got justified? It's all of those. Everybody who gets justified is going to be glorified. We don't believe any attrition occurs there. We don't believe, like our Armenian friends do, that you can lose your salvation. All right, so everybody who gets justified gets glorified. Okay, well then, who gets justified? Back it up. The ones who get called. All who get called or some who get called? Well, this is where Baptist theologians, some of those that doc, Dr. Dockery mentioned this morning, have distinguished between what we call general call and defectual call. And the effectual call is when, you know, the general call is when I preach and everybody hears it. But the effectual call is when the Holy Spirit applies it. The Holy Spirit opens Lydia's heart. Isn't that what it says in the book of Acts that the Lord did? He opened her heart and she believed. What does it say in Acts chapter uh, 13 about uh, uh, 
verse 48 when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicifying, rejoicifying, that's a good word, rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Well, again, I can't reverse that order. The text says what the text says, and it says that the ones who believed were the, exactly the ones who had been appointed to eternal life. I already shared with you from John 17. Jesus said, I pray not for the world. I pray for these you have given me. I'll cl close with this one thing. And please, I, I'm, I'm animated about stuff, but I'm, my wife tells me I, sometimes I look too angry. I, I'm, I hope she's not watching. Um, <laughs> I, and I'm, I'm not, so forgive me. Again, please forgive me if I come across a little too animated and excited. But in a sense, I, I think I can prove to everybody here that everybody sitting in this room in some way believes in limited atonement. And I would ask you simply this, do you believe that fallen angels can be saved? Does the scripture not distinguish between the elect angels? Paul says, I charge you before the elect angels. And then Jude talks about those angels that sinned are reserved in chains of darkness. Don't we sing songs like it's a, it's a song holy angels cannot sing? The angels know nothing of the grace of God. So at the very least, at the very least, God limited the scope of the atonement to the human race. And there are other sentient moral creatures with the capacity to know God and to sin for whom Christ did not die. Now, why does that not trouble us? Because we're provincial. It only troubles us if you talk about, well, maybe, maybe Jesus died only for a group of the people that he calls his people. And that makes us uncomfortable because we think about our loved ones. My father-in-law, who I prayed for, for 32 years, trusted Jesus last month. I can't tell you the joy that's brought in our heart, but I'm going to tell you something. It wasn't because he got wiser or smarter or understood better because he'd had his way for 85 years. He'd had his way. But the Lord opened his heart and he believed. And I, I have to trust the Lord with that more than I have to trust my father-in-law with that. And so, yes, I believe that Jesus died for a particular people. And yet I believe that I can say to everybody, I think there's a sense in which Jesus died for, I do believe in original sin. And I believe Christ died for the Adamic sin in all people. I personally uh, inter interpret all the universal statements that the universal statements that way that when Christ died for all, that he died for the Adamic sin for all. I don't believe, for instance, babies go to hell because I think Christ died for the Adamic sin. Uh, and and uh, we're judged for the deeds done in the body. Uh, you know, there's a lot more that I could say here than I don't want to take too much time, and I know Dr. Lemke has much to answer here. But uh, I, I think that the scripture teaches that Jesus died for his people. My personal view is that his death is sufficient for all. I, I don't have the quantitative view that some of my dear friends have, that Spurgeon had, that if there had been one more elect, Jesus would have had to suffer more. That's not my view. I believe his, his death was sufficient for all, but it is efficient for the elect, those, for those whom the Holy Spirit effectually calls. And uh, I can recommend some good reading to you if you want to know more. I, th I think Dr. York was right when he introduced it, he said this would be really the issue. It would take the most the time, the heart. So I want to, uh, Dr. Lemke, give you time, particularly well, redemption. Well, I, I actually uh, have less to say about this because it's such an unpopular doctrine. Uh, uh, I mean, the, of, of all the five points, this is the one that the overwhelming majority of Baptists reject. Uh, even some people who call themselves Calvinist or as uh, Dr. Uh, Dockery called them four-point Calvinists, sometimes called Amaraldian Calvinists because of uh, a teacher named 
Emerald who, uh, who worked around this point. Uh, sometimes they're called Christmas Calvinists because there's no L. Um, the, uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, this doctrine is so far out there, even the abstract of principles doesn't have it, uh, according to uh, yeah. Dr. Will's uh, recent history of Southern Seminary, and probably it was because uh, John A. Broadus, Dr. York's uh, uh, forerunner and preaching at Southern, uh, simply would not buy into it. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that uh, uh, it, it's... Um, uh, now, here, here is the common ground, and I think we can agree on this. At least many Calvinists can agree with us that the atonement of Christ is sufficient for all and efficient for the elect. As long as the elect means those who believe in Christ... <laughs> I believe that we can all affirm that the atonement is sufficient for all and efficient for those who believe. I mean, somebody else is not going to be saved and Jesus is going to have to come back the second time, you know, for, you know, a thousand more forgivenesses. Uh, his death is sufficient. It is once for all, as repeated so many times in the epistles. Now, uh, where we would disagree is, you know, the intent of the atonement. And, uh, you know, the article on salvation, Baptist Faith and Message, says that salvation is offered freely to all who accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And um, um, I, I think that it would be important, uh, sometimes it's called the well-meant offer in uh, some versions of Calvinism, but that when we preach, we genuinely believe that in the case of your father-in-law, who you've prayed for and witnessed to for years, but you don't just give up and say, you know, well, right. I guess he's just not one of the elect. That's right. You know, you keep on preaching. Amen. And if they're elect, they'll show up. <laughs> Amen. They'll, they'll respond in faith. Now, you know, I will interpret that a different way and say not that he had any merit or he got smarter, but he yielded his will to the, to the impulse of the Holy Spirit. And I think we agree at some level at that. Uh, we would just use uh, different uh, terms to describe it. Now, Romans 8, I would say, should be read frontwards the way it was written, not backwards. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and by the way, I mean, Scripture's quite clear that many are, are called, but not all are chosen. And it has a number of analogies and parables about sending workers out, you know, sending out people for the feast, and, and the people reject the invitation and send out more and compel them to come in. And so the idea that the gospel invitation is, and, and that wasn't a fake offer of the gospel, that was a genuine offer, a genuine offer to the feast. Uh, they simply rejected it, which is getting to the next point about irresistible grace. But uh, 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 God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him. And uh, I think that's the concern. Again, there's so many expressions of limited atonement, particular redemption, uh, one of the difficulties of talking about Calvinism, as Dr. Dockery pointed out, is there are so many versions of it that what you might say might be true of one version but not of another version. Uh, but uh, this would be the concern that we could say to all people, Jesus died and his death is sufficient for your sin if you trust him. I will note as we pass on to respect our time, I will note that I'll come back. I think there was at least a, a sentence there uh, regarding sufficiency and efficacy that we could, perhaps both of you were, would be comfortable uh, with that. Uh, but irre, uh, irresistible grace or? Well, irresistible grace, again, it, it's, it's in, a, in a sense, it's unfortunate because that phrase alone makes it sound like People are dragged, kicking and screaming into the kingdom of God, totally against their will. Uh, but uh, I guess the best way I can put it is, in 1980, I was 
standing in the junior department uh, at Ashland Avenue Baptist Church uh, at a party, a gathering that I was about to be called as their new minister of, of uh, music and youth. And they were having a little get-together for me with uh, teens and college-age kids, and this gorgeous blonde walked through the door. And I looked at a cousin of mine who was there. I said, who is that? And he said, that's, that's Tanya Sharp. I'm going to tell you something. I was irresistibly drawn to her. And uh, I've been irresistibly drawn to her ever since. Many were called, but few were chosen. That's right, buddy. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> oh, it gets better than that. <laughs> Just one was chosen. Uh, and... Uh, uh, you know, she, my grandmother said to me, my grandmother observed her around me. She said, she, she said to Herschel, that girl's serious about you. And she has, and her phrase was, set her cap for you. you if you're not serious about her, you, you better get away because she's serious about you. And I said, Mamma, I'm not running very fast. <laughs> now, here's the thing. I fell in love with her. I, I was overwhelmed with love for her. 13 days after that event, we picked out her rings and my ring, and we got married six months later. And that's been, it'll be, you know, 32 years next March. Now, now when I describe that, I don't say, well, you know, boy, that, Tanya just really came at me hard and I didn't have any choice in the matter. No. I. I fell in love with her. I, I helped her fall in love with me. I, I was overwhelmed by her. I was wooed, and, and I wooed her. And so it is that the, the, the grace of God did not come to me and do something against my will. The grace of God came and changed my will. He changed my wanter. I wanted to go my own way. I wanted Herschel's way, and suddenly, the way of life appealed to me. I wanted the Lord Jesus. I wanted to be ruled by him. And that's what grace does. So irresistible grace uh, doesn't mean that we're dragged kicking and screaming. It means God, the Holy Spirit, changes our will where we were directed against God. Uh, remember, uh, I, Bubba has pointed out how much we've talked about songs, but uh, I'm not sure Wesley means it the way I mean it when I sing it. But but I, I love that verse, uh, long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. To me, that's a beautiful description of irresistible grace. I mean, a prisoner doesn't resist getting out of a cell. Uh, he, he wants to, and that's what the grace of God does. Dr. Lemke. If uh, all Calvinists described irresistible grace like uh, Dr. Dockery and, and Dr. York, uh, you know, I, I think Arminians would be pleased because they're talking about prevenient grace that uh, the Holy Spirit works on people so compellingly and lovingly that people just want to respond in faith, uh, but that's not the way all Calvinists define irresistible grace. They use terms like being drawn, literally, uh, from uh, John uh, 6, I believe, 5 or 6, and uh, uh, they use more forceful language that he imposes his, his uh, will on ours and, and so forth. So I think that uh, there is a diversity, perhaps, within Calvinism about that. If it's simply the point that the Holy Spirit is working on us and convicting us and convincing us, we have no debate. It is the issue of, at the end of the day, do I have free will to respond, yes or no? And, uh, you know, well, again, let Well, let me be m more disagreeable then. Uh, <laughs> because I do believe, I believe it's both and. I don't, I, don't, I don't believe it's either or. I do believe that the Holy Spirit draws us. Uh, I, and, I, and listen, if you just want a Jesus who blesses you and pleads with you, but not a Jesus who rules you and commands you, 
then you do not want the Jesus of the Bible. I mean, uh, so it's both and, uh, and I, I want to make that clear. I don't, want to, I, I don't want to back away at all from the fact <laughs> that the Holy Spirit draws us compellingly, so compellingly that we do not, we cannot resist. I do believe that. I've already read the sections in the Baptist faith and message that, that at each point in salvation, the, the words regeneration and uh, justification, the doctrine of salvation, each of those speaks of a response that we must make. And then Article 5 in God's Purposes of Grace says, election is consistent with the free agency of man, that we at some level are free to accept or reject. My friend Ken Keithley has picked up an analogy somebody else had about an ambulance. And you're in a wreck, you're on the side of the road, and, uh, and I've literally been in this situation where where you can't get up. And, uh, and, and so the ambulance comes, they have the little cot, they put you on it, they uh, take you to the uh, hospital. And you really, I mean, I didn't take hold of anything. I didn't, uh, I didn't walk toward it. I didn't, uh, I didn't make the call. I was being carried to that point. But when I got to the hospital, they had a consent form. <laughs> Either you're going to receive treatment or you're not. And uh, uh, that's what I think uh, Scripture talks about. Certainly it talks about uh, people rejecting the Lord, that, that He calls you and yet they reject. Uh, Proverbs 124, I called and you refused. Hosea 11, when, I, when Israel was a child, I love him out of Egypt, I called my son, but they refused to repent. Psalm 78, 10, they refuse to walk in his law. Psalm 81, uh, my people would not heed my voice. Jeremiah 32, they have turned their backs on me. Uh, but more particularly, I would point out in the New Testament, Stephen talking to the elect nation of Israel saying, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You're doing just as your fathers did. So he's, he is speaking not just to that generation, to, but to many generations of the chosen people. And of course, Jesus in his lament over Jerusalem in Matthew 23 said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I have wanted to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. And that language is even more striking in Greek because the same word will is used. I willed, but you willed not. And so clearly there is some point at which we can accept or reject the grace of God. And yes, you would think that people would want to get out of prison. But I know people who would rather stay in prison. I know people who would rather stay in the pigsty than straighten up their life. And it's just stubborn sinfulness. It is rejection of the Holy Spirit, which is the unforgivable sin. Dr. York, perseverance of the saints. Uh, perseverance of the saints uh, often is called uh, eternal security uh, and pretty much all but free will Baptists, uh, true Arminian Baptists agree that those that are genuinely born again, those that are truly regenerated by the Holy Spirit will, like I said in Romans 8, those who are justified will be glorified. And uh, I think you can read that backwards or forwards. It works either direction. And uh, what that, but what that also means, what we've got to be careful to say that we do not believe in cheap grace uh, that one can make a profession of faith and be baptized in a church and have their name on a roll and, and then live uh, really for themselves and for the devil with no submission to the Lordship of Christ and still go to heaven. What we would say, where we dis, dis, differ with true Arminians, is that that person was never genuinely born again to, be, to begin with, 
that they didn't lose their salvation. They never had it to begin with. And so I, I doubt seriously that we have a, a very much of a difference on this point. Oh, we that. can find difference where there is none. Uh, <laughs> Certainly, uh, we agree, uh, the Baptist faith and message says all true believers endure to the end. They will never fall away from the state of grace because they're kept by the power of God. And uh, if by perseverance we mean preservation of the saints, because it's not up to us, friends. If our salvation is up to us, we're going to get lost as a duck whether we've been saved or not. And in fact, if you go back in the Augustinian tradition. You know, you accept the view that uh, Dr. York has endorsed, that, you know, you, you really have no free will and then become a Christian and suddenly you have it. And the early Augustinians said, well, you could actually have an election to justification, but then lose your salvation by not having good works. <laughs> so you have to have an election to justification, but you also need a, an election to sanctification. So you could literally be justified, but not saved. And uh, it, it is a, I mean, I don't know why I get all these horror stories, but I get horror stories about uh, youth ministers who tell their kids that if you do this sin, this sin, you're not really saved. Or churches that are beaten up week after week and told, you know, we have to have regenerate church membership. If you don't do this, this, and this, then you're not really saved. Now, we all believe in a regenerate church membership. That's a great concept. But, but we don't want to go back to the Puritan days where they, day by day, had no assurance of their salvation because they didn't know if they were jumping high enough. And we've got to rest in the promises of God that, you know, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. We're doubly sealed by Jesus' the Son who says, I keep them in my hand. And then he says, we're triply sealed by God the Father, that he is greater than all, than no one, even Satan himself, can, can take us out of the Father's hand. And so, uh, the Satan himself was a little addition there. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is, the only way we can be saved is by the grace of God. It's not good works, and it's, it's not good works before we're saved, but it's not good works after we're saved. And so, uh, I, you know, I really believe in the security of the believer and the preservation of uh, the believer. Sometimes when we say perseverance, that sounds like, as long as I really hold out, I'm going to get saved. And I don't think that's the promise that we have. Well, uh, I, I do want to point out, 1 Corinthians 10 is a stern warning where Paul looks at the children of Israel that had everything right on the outside. They were baptized into Moses, ate that spiritual food, drank that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. But with the majority of them, God was not pleased. They were scattered in the wilderness. And, and he says this right after he uses the possibility of, of in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, and I beat my body daily. I bring it under subjection, lest I myself, having preached to others, should be a docimos, and that does not mean backslidden. Uh, and, and so both of these things are true. We, the only way we can persevere is if we are preserved. I'm with you there. But you talk about horror stories. I don't know about you, but I hear a lot more horror stories about worldliness in our churches than churches where their people are afraid that if they don't live holy lives, they're going to go to hell. Uh, that's the real horror story that I hear and have to deal with on a daily basis as a pastor is that people think that somehow they treat Jesus as a, as a convenient fire escape rather than as Lord of their lives. And, and to me, uh, we, there is a biblical admonition that we must hold fast, that we must not let these things slip. It's not that we maintain our salvation. It's that we demonstrate our salvation is real. And the only way we do that is that we live out. We work out our own salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who has worked in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Both of those things are true, and they're both in the Scripture. Thank you. Um, you've heard the uh, uh, brief 
description of <laughs> theological differences. Not that brave. <laughs> well, it, it was interesting. Uh, total depravity, six minutes. Uh, unconditional election, six minutes. Limited atonement, 15 minutes. Irresistible grace, nine minutes. And perseverance of the saints, uh, four minutes. Let, let, let me ask you this. We've discussed um, differences. We've discussed common ground. Uh, some things you've said, you said uh, either of you have said, well, I, I, I agree with that. I agree that that's what the scripture teaches. I just probably wouldn't use that word or this word might not be helpful. So uh, let me ask you both, uh, are, are there things, uh, Dr. Dockery spoke about the Triennial Convention and the Southern Baptist Convention being founded upon missions. Uh, we recently had the Great Commission resurgence. We want to focus on the Great Commission. So are there things that Southern Baptists desire uh, that give you concern that people who are not Calvinistic would undermine those things? Are there things that Southern Baptists desire that give you concern that people who are Calvinistic would undermine those Great Commission goals uh, either way? Now, start with you, Dr. Lemke. Well, I, I think that um, uh, we clearly have a resurgence of Calvinism and uh, uh, I think, as Dr. Nettles pointed out in a recent talk, that that creates some discomfort when, when the percentages are, are changing. Now, by LifeWay research uh, statistics, uh, between 90, 80 and 90 percent of Southern Baptists say that they're not five-point Calvinists. So you're talking about an overwhelming majority here. Uh, I think we all would recognize that many of our seminary students, whether at New Orleans Seminary or Southern Seminary, a much higher percentage than certainly any time in my life in ministry, uh, are inclined in a Calvinist direction. They already come to seminary with uh, pre-commitments uh, toward Calvinism, uh, largely because of non-SBC speakers uh, like uh, John Piper and others. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think it's an open question about when they get out and graduate, are there going to be churches for them out there? You know, are they going to be honest when they go and interview with committees? Uh, are they going to go in and try to force uh, their hand in churches, which I have been in one after another uh, that split over this issue uh, because their, their pastor really didn't, wasn't honest on the front end. Uh, and had a theology that was significantly different than what the church believed. Uh, are we going to have proportionality in, uh, you know, in our entities and so forth that matches up to that uh, 80, 90 percent uh, uh, to 10 to 20 percent? Uh, are we going to have some, some kind of balance there uh, uh, that's proportional to what most Baptists believe? So uh, I think there are a lot of questions. I, I mean, I think that most Southern Baptist Calvinists of this generation are committed to missions and evangelism. And uh, we have some, uh, former professor of New Orleans Seminary, uh, 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 David Platt, certainly one of his passions is missions. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, that as long as that is the case, that there is a common denominator that we can uh, work together. Um, but we're going to, I think it's going to come down to the church level and the associational level uh, about, uh, and, and I honestly, uh, many of these who, who were influenced by people of other denominations, when they graduate and there's not a position for them, I think they may go back to some other denomination because... Uh, uh, there's, there's really uh, many churches would feel uncomfortable uh, with the direction that they have. But uh, uh, I think that, that there would be maybe two or three things I would really look for. Are they committed to missions and evangelism, number one? And number two, that they talk more about Calvin or about Jesus would be number two. Because I guarantee you there are no, the Arminians don't talk about Arminius. You know, <laughs> so do you talk about Calvin more? Do you go to meetings about Calvin or meetings about Jesus? And, and what's really your passion and your heart? You know, look at the blogs. Are they talking about Jesus or are they talking about what Calvin said? 
So, uh, you know, I think, what is your passion? And what do you talk about? And I, I, I mean, I really loved what Dr. York said that, you know, my congregation didn't even know I was a Calvinist until, uh, you know, they knew I was coming to this conference. That's great. You know, because they, uh, you know, he just preached the word. And, and it was not trying to cram something down their throat, you know, totally change their church governance, uh, change things around. So uh, I think those are some keys to working cooperatively. Dr. York, as regards to the Great Commission, do you have concerns about people who are, are non-Calvinist? Uh, well, I, you know, I have concerns for our entire convention. I, I do want to say this. If 10% of our pastors are Calvinist, and 80% of our churches are plateaued or in decline. It's not Calvinism that is our problem. We have a problem. Uh, it, it might be partly getting sidetracked on some things. It might be that we're threatened and we can't, can't discuss these things, but clearly we're not going to the lost. And uh, one thing I, I certainly agree with doc, Dr. Lemke on is it, it, it's about missions and evangelism and the gospel. Uh, it, and it's getting out there. You know, I, I don't push the label Calvinist because I don't, I don't, don't find it helpful. Like I said, I, I've never really read Calvin. I, I do preach the text, and it tends to be interpreted uh, in people's minds. So they say, oh, that's, that's Calvinism, and, and I, I, I believe that. But, but frankly, uh, you know, if you come to Buck Run, you're going to hear, like, you know, last, a week ago today, we had a program where we had, uh, over a hundred families come into our church and get school supplies, single moms. And you know, this week I was in the home of one of these whose husband was in prison for 15 years, and uh, then he was released on DNA evidence. He was clear of the crime he was accused of, but he got AIDS while he was in prison from tattoo needles. And, and you talk about a hopeless situation. And I was able to go into that, hope, in, into that home and share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ and see hope on their faces. And, you know, that's what we've got to do. That, that's what our churches have to be known for. And, you know, I, I believe what I believe. I'm not ashamed of what I believe. I'll tell anybody what I believe. I'm never dishonest about what I believe. But what I want to be known for is a passion for the Lord Jesus Christ, a submission to his lordship and his will, and, and a love for his word, his people, a love for the lost. That's what we've got to do. And, you know, I get troubled by this. You know, there's this this constant pressure. It used to be, you know, when I was young, we were upset with the professors at Southern Seminary because they didn't believe the abstract of principles, and now we're upset with them because they do. Uh, somewhere in there, we've got to say it's about the gospel. We can work together, and frankly, I think we have the mechanism that makes it possible, and that is the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. I'm there is nothing in the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 that makes me or other Calvinists unable to believe what we believe. Uh, and, and Dr. Lemke and I can both sign the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. You probably couldn't sign the abstract, but, uh, <laughs> but, but we signed the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. And, and you know, that's, what, that's our denomination's doctrinal parameters. I think we have that mechanism. I say, let's be satisfied with that mechanism. Let's work together within that and give each other the opportunity to preach and teach what we believe. Uh, and, uh, and I think we can, we can reach the lost and glorify the Lord Jesus in that way. That's, that's my heart's prayer and desire. Thank you so much, both of you. I want to ask you to do me a favor, please. I um, want, want to take a 10-minute stand up or run to the restroom break and we're going to ask Dr. Page and Dr. Dockery to join us here and we're going to have a time of Q&A with questions that have been submitted but I want to just ask you to take a 10 minute uh, stand up or restroom break and we'll begin right back in 10 minutes. <laughs>